Thanks for tuning in. Please like, subscribe, and check out my Instagram for cool science and not science stuff. And a big thank you to my patrons on Patreon for your contributions to my channel. Welcome back to Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. In this video, we're going to be talking about functional electrical stimulation, or FES. We're going to look at three examples of when you would use FES, and then at the end of the video, we'll come back and we'll look at the parameters. So when we use NMES or Russian stimulation, we're generally using it for one of two purposes. Either edema control, which is the less common use, or for strengthening a muscle or keeping something from atrophying further. So for example, if you have somebody uh, following a total knee arthroplasty, they're in a rehab program, or following an ACL reconstruction in a rehab program, at some point, you might want to focus on strengthening their quadriceps. And if those people cannot do certain exercises that might be necessary to strengthen those muscles, then you might consider hooking them up to NMES or Russian and doing isometric exercises with the electric stimulation. But that's not what functional electrical stimulation is for. When we term it FES, it's not for edema control, it's not for strengthening, it's actually for neuromuscular re-education following some kind of neurological event, most commonly a stroke. And so really it's for regaining function. So FES is really just NMES or Russian for function, not strengthening, not edema control. Okay, so through the course of this video, we're going to look at three specific examples, and then we'll go back and we'll look at the parameters. The first one you might see following a cerebrovascular accident or stroke would be drop foot. So drop foot is something that occurs when a patient is no longer able to dorsiflex their ankle because the tibialis anterior muscle has become paretic or weak as a result of the stroke. So if the tibialis anterior is weak, and they're not able to activate the muscle because of the stroke, then one option would be to activate the muscle using FES. So why might inability to dorsiflex the ankle be problematic? Well, if you can't dorsiflex the ankle, you're going to end up with, by default, excessive plantar flexion. And so your toes and foot are just going to be hanging down, right? But what happens when you're walking and you're swinging that leg through? Remember, during the swing phase, we need active dorsiflexion to clear the foot and toes across the ground. Well, if you're in excessive plantar flexion because you cannot dorsiflex at the talocrural or ankle joint, well then, especially during initial swing and mid-swing, that foot's going to drop and hit the floor, leading to a fall. Okay, So during certain phases of gait, not all of them, of course, but certain phases, we may want to stimulate the tibialis anterior. And so there's two common locations uh, to stimulate the tibialis anterior. Okay. Uh, this is an either or, it's not both. Okay? So the first target could be the common fibular nerve or the common perineal nerve. When you stimulate the common fibular nerve, uh, you actually stimulate one of its branches, which is the deep fibular nerve, which is what innervates the tibialis anterior. Okay? And so whenever you want to stimulate the common fibular nerve, you basically place the electrode just inferior to the head of the fibula. You can palpate the head of the fibula, and then you just stick the electrode directly inferior to that. Okay? The other way that you can stimulate the tibialis anterior is basically by putting the electrode directly on the muscle belly. So here's some electrodes right here. This first one really is directly on the muscle belly of tibialis anterior. Now for its exact location, this is a little bit confusing here because I got it directly out of the textbook, it says lateral and distal to the popliteal fossa. This is probably not the best way to describe this. The popliteal fossa is the back of your knee, right? The crease of your knee. So basically, if you go a little bit distal of that, now you're on kind of the proximal gastroc, right? And go lateral to that, uh, that's kind of where they say you should put the electrode. Really, a better way to describe it would be lateral to the anterior crest of the tibia. I don't know why this is like this. I probably should have written that there. But it's lateral to the anterior crest of the tibia. Okay? Now, in all reality, this electrode should probably be placed even more lateral than that. And the reason for that is because the tibialis anterior has two actions. The first is obviously dorsiflexion. That's what we normally think of. But it also acts to invert at the subtalar joint, so dorsiflexion and inversion. Now, if we only stimulate the tibialis anterior, then not only are they going to have dorsiflexion, but also inversion. 
Okay? Inversion can be a problem during gait because as you land, you could roll the ankle. And for someone like a stroke patient that has very little control of that extremity, that could be very problematic. So by placing this electrode a little more laterally, which is kind of what this is trying to refer to, um, you'll not only get the tibialis anterior, but also the fibularis longus. The fibularis longus is strictly an everter. That's mainly what it does. So by giving an eversion moment, that helps to counterbalance the inversion moment of tibialis anterior. And so more or less as you go through that swing, um, the ankle joint remains at about subtalar joint neutral. So no excessive inversion and also no excessive eversion. Those are two precautions. So when you're actually setting up these electrodes and figuring out exactly how you want to program the parameters, you want to monitor to make sure that you're not getting excessive eversion, especially if you're stimulating the fibularis muscle, but also not excessive inversion because of that tibialis anterior. Okay. The other important thing that we've hinted at is that when you're using FES for drop foot, we're not stimulating the tibialis anterior all the time. It's only at certain phases of gait. It looks like we're skipping terminal stance and going directly to early pre-swing right here. And here's late pre-swing in the third picture. And it says here that there's a foot switch that detects the heel rise. Obviously, the heel comes off of the ground as we get towards the end of terminal stance and into pre-swing. And so there needs to be something that senses that. Well, in some cases, it's a simple foot switch. Uh, here it's an inertial sensor. There's a lot of different ways you can use this. Okay, So the foot switch or the inertial sensor senses that the heel comes off of the ground, so it knows that you're in pre-swing. And then as you get to the end of pre-swing, so late pre-swing right here, uh, it causes stimulation to those electrodes. Well, why would you want that? Because immediately when this toe comes off of the ground and you go into uh, initial swing, which it looks like we've skipped, and then here's mid-swing right here, remember that foot needs to clear the ground. So through initial swing and mid-swing, we need to have stimulation of the tibialis anterior. Now again, how you do that depends on where the electrode is. Are we stimulating the common fibular nerve? So it's going to be inferior to the head of the fibula. Are we stimulating the tibialis anterior directly? So here would be the electrode placement or a little more lateral to that. Just depends. But either way, you're going to get dorsiflexion and a little bit of eversion if you stimulate those fibularis muscles to help get that foot to clear the ground. Okay? So you get this dorsiflexion and eversion through the swing. And then once we get to initial contact here where the heel touches the ground, again, that switch or here the inertial sensor is going to sense that and then as the foot gets lowered to the ground, remember this is a controlled plantar flexion of the heel to the ground through loading response. And so it's controlled through the tibialis anterior. So the tibialis anterior does need to fire as this foot is going from initial contact to loading response. However, once we get past loading response, there's no more need for that tibialis anterior. So then from this loading response all the way until we get to that maybe that end of terminal stance to initial pre-swing, through that time then the electrode is not going to be firing. So again, we're not stimulating the tibialis anterior through the entire phase of gait, only certain parts of gait. And you can have these sensors that do that, or um, if you're just doing this for the purpose of training in a clinic, you can actually have the clinician actually push a button that stimulates the tibialis anterior to contract when they want it to. Or you can have it where it does this automatically through sensors that are usually at the foot or the ankle joint. So hopefully that makes sense. The second application of this is what we see often in severe strokes, which is risk for anterior glenohumeral subluxation. That's a fancy way of saying that the shoulder can dislocate, meaning the humeral head can come out of the glenoid fossa, and it actually tends to move more anteriorly, so an anterior glenohumeral subluxation. Okay? Um, this is because following a stroke, those rotator cuff muscles on the effective side, they become severely paretic. Remember the function of the rotator cuff muscles, other than producing rotational movements, they hold the humeral head packed into that glenoid fossa. Well, if those muscles become weak, they can no longer stabilize a glenohumeral joint. And so you're more susceptible in that case for subluxation, and if it goes even further, dislocation, which is obviously bad. So the goal of FES here is stabilize the shoulder joint and prevent subluxation. Now, just to be clear here, when we did the ankle dorsiflexion example for foot drop, 
Uh, these targets right here were an either or. Okay? We're not doing both of these. Okay? So we either targeted the common fibular nerve or we targeted the muscle belly of tibialis anterior. For this setup, we have to put these electrodes on both of these positions. So one will go on the supraspinatus. And that one is the active electrode. Okay? And the other one goes on the middle or the posterior deltoid. In this picture, it's on the posterior deltoid. That one's probably more common. And this is what we call the indifferent electrode. So one's active, one's indifferent. So here's our active electrode. This is the one over the supraspinatus. And then here's the indifferent electrode, the one over the posterior deltoid. Now, when we turn the machine on and apply the current, the current doesn't just flow directly from the active to the indifferent electrode by flowing over the skin, right? The skin is an insulator, so it's going to take the path of least resistance, and the current's going to kind of curve through into deeper tissues, and then it's going to curve back to the indifferent electrode like you see here in this picture. But that's the important thing here, is there's muscles within that path. So the way to think about it is the current's going to start at this active electrode, it's going to penetrate through the skin to deeper layers or deeper tissues, and then circle around back to the indifferent electrode. Well, what's within that path? Well, you've got those muscles attached to the scapula, which are the rotator cuff muscles, right? So the posterior ones would be infraspinatus, teres minor, a little bit anterior to that would be the subscapularis, right? And then the active electrode's on the supraspinatus, so that one's automatically hit. And the point is, is you actually stimulate those rotator cuff muscles. Yes, the rotator cuff muscles do produce internal and external rotation of the shoulder joint, but for our purposes here, we really are looking to keep that humeral head packed as tightly as possible into the scapular glenoid fossa. Now, when we did this for ankle dorsiflexion, we only wanted that tibialis anterior muscle to be active during certain parts of gait, right? So maybe at the very end of pre-swing, all the way through the end of loading response, but then all other phases we want the tibialis anterior to not be on because it's not necessary. So we have on periods and off periods. This is something that we just want on all the time because we want that humeral head to be stuck there in the glenoid fossa because if we turn it off, then we risk subluxation or dislocation. So this application doesn't have an on or an off we would leave it always on to keep that stability of the shoulder joint intact, okay? Now the main precaution here is you wanna avoid excessive shoulder shrug or shoulder abduction. So yes, the current's going through here and it's getting those rotator cuff muscles, but of course we have shoulder girdle muscles in there, right? So this active electrode is on the supraspinatus, but it's also pretty close to the upper trapezius, right? And so if you get the upper trapezius in that, it'll cause the shoulders to shrug up. We want to avoid that. Also, um, depending on how big the person is or the exact electrode placement, uh, you may actually get some middle deltoid activation here, okay, depending on how that current flows. So middle deltoid is going to give you some shoulder abduction, which we probably want to be good about avoiding because, as we'll see in just a few minutes, somebody that has a flexion synergy of the upper extremity will likely also have some abduction by default. So we don't want any more abduction or shoulder elevation, okay? The last application that you might see is for getting wrist and finger extension. So following a lot of strokes, a patient will have what's called an upper extremity flexion synergy. So here's a good flexion synergy on the left upper extremity. So this would have been a right brain stroke leading to left paresis, but it's not just that there's weakness on the left side, you have this flexion synergy. And so here's what you have. The scapula will be retracted and elevated. You can certainly see that the scapula is elevated here. It looks like the left shoulder shrugged up. Shoulder will be an abduction and a little bit of external rotation. And then here's the more obvious stuff. The elbow will be flexed. The forearm will be supinated. The wrist is going to be flexed. You can see that. The fingers are going to be flexed, right? And so this is going to be problematic if you're trying to grasp something. If you can't open up your hand and you try to grasp something, you're just going to knock it. Before you grasp, you have to open up the hand and the fingers. In order to do that, you have to use the wrist and finger extensors. Okay? And so these muscles are going to likely be weak and also opposed by this upper extremity flexion synergy. And so in order to promote wrist and finger extension, we're going to put two electrodes on, so both of them, not either or, both. One is going to target the extensor carpi radialis longus, or ECRL. 
The other will target the extensor current beat radialis brevis or ECRB. Now, in the forearm, there's of course a lot of little muscles in there, right? So you're not just gonna get these two muscles. You'll likely have some other extensors activated as well, which is good, okay? These are just probably the two most important to be targeting. So what about electrode placement? Well, they're both gonna go on the dorsal forearm. So here's one electrode. This one would be more targeting extensor carpi radialis longus, the muscle belly. The red one right here would be targeting extensor carpi radialis brevis and collectively you're going to facilitate more wrist extension and finger extension. Here's another view of those electrodes placed right here, okay, on the dorsal forearm. Now, because you can't really only target those two muscles because there's tons of little bitty muscles in there, you're likely gonna also target some other muscles that may produce radial deviation and ulnar deviation. And that leads us to this precaution that we want to avoid excessive radial or ulnar deviation because if you have excessive of any of those, it's going to make grasping even more difficult okay? and create bad movement patterns. So we want to keep the wrist in the frontal plane as neutral as possible, so no excessive uh, of either of those. And so if you do have excessive of either of those, it may be as simple as toggling the exact location of those electrodes. You might want to move one a little more medially, maybe a little more laterally, until you get a situation where you're only getting that wrist extension and neither of these are excessive. So finally, we'll talk about the parameters for functional electrical stimulation. Now, just like NMES or Russian stimulation, we have a pulse duration, we have a frequency in hertz or, or pulses per second, and we also have an intensity that we'll talk about, but notice there's no ramp time, okay? It doesn't matter what you're using this for, we're never gonna use a ramp for functional electrical stimulation. That's because when we want the muscle to fire, we want it to fire right then. We don't want it to wait. It needs to fire right then, and it needs to turn off right then. Okay, so no ramps in FES. But everything else really just depends on if the patient's uncomfortable or not, if they're fatigued or not, or maybe they're both fatigued and uncomfortable. There's different ways you can toggle these settings to get it right for that particular patient. So there's a lot of trial and error with setting up functional electrical stimulation. So the normal settings are gonna be between 200 and 400 microseconds for pulse duration, okay? This depends in large part on the size of the muscle, okay? Frequency is gonna be greater than 35 hertz. Generally speaking, in order to increase patient comfort, you increase the frequency, but starting at about 35 or 40 hertz is a good place to start. And then we have this intensity, which is measured in milliamps, and this is just a way to basically get more of the movement. So let's suppose you're doing this for ankle dorsiflexion, and you've got the electrodes placed and set up, and um, you're avoiding excessive subtalar eversion and inversion, but you're just not getting enough dorsiflexion, right? You want a little bit more dorsiflexion as they're going through gait. Well, then you crank up the intensity. So there's going to be more current running through and probably more dorsiflexion, right? Again, a lot of trial and error. Now, let's suppose the patient is uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable for them. Well, we want to increase patient comfort, so we don't do anything to the pulse duration, and we don't do anything to the intensity. If they're uncomfortable, just like we saw before for all the other kinds of e-stim, we increase the frequency. That doesn't change. So maybe they start at 40 hertz. We can increase to 45 hertz, even 50. Okay, so just increase the frequency. What happens if the patient's fatigued? Well, that's no good if they're fatigued because they're not going to be able to do what they need to do on a daily basis. So we want to reduce the fatigue. The way we do that is we keep the frequency the same. We don't touch that but we actually decrease the pulse duration. So if they started out at 250 microseconds, maybe we try dropping it to 225 microseconds, okay? So drop the pulse duration, but then we have to increase the intensity, okay? So usually we change both of those things. Probably gonna crank down the pulse duration first and then increase the intensity. If they're fatigued and uncomfortable, then we have to adjust all three of these things. We're gonna generally decrease the pulse duration we're gonna decrease the frequency, but then we'll have to increase the intensity to compensate for these two things dropping. So functional electrical stimulation is very much trial and error. You can have two patients with the exact same condition, and these parameters will all be different. The electrode placement might be a little bit different. It's a lot of toggling things and just playing around. 
but this is something that can be used to help people with their everyday activities of life. So hopefully this video gave you a good understanding of functional electrical stimulation. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you.